to hear her discuss grid integrated wind energy potential in China. She works from both the technical and political economy angles to examine um, clean energy transitions in developing countries. She's an expert on China's energy system, including technology and business model innovation, energy system governance, and the management of air pollution and climate change. She works with a collaborative team of researchers to study the micro and macro determinants of clean energy transitions in emerging markets, with a focus on China and India. From 2011 to 2015, she directed the MIT Tsinghua Ch China Energy and Climate Project, a five-year research effort focused on analyzing the design of energy and climate change policy in China and its domestic and global impacts. She's a faculty affiliate of the MIT um, Joint Program on the Science and Policy of Global Change and the MIT Energy Initiative. She has a, a BS in Biochemistry and Political Science from Yale and a PhD in Engineering Systems from MIT. Thanks for joining us. Great, thank you, Denise. Uh, can everyone hear me, or is like, everyone can hear me, right? In the back? Excellent. Okay, well, it's great to be here. It's actually my first time back at Princeton since I was biking between New York and Washington, D.C., and was camped out on the other side of the Nassau Hill. So it's terrific to be back in a bit more of an official capacity. That was the climate ride in 2009, so I'm here to, again, because of climate change, but also because I think of the local air pollution challenges that China's facing, to talk to you today about grid integrated wind energy potential in China. I'm also delighted for the second time, so that Denise mentioned the talk at Stanford, my whole family came out to hear that talk, and now I have two of my cousins uh, here uh, today, so it's always terrific. Um, someone told me there's nothing more terrifying than having your family in the audience. <laughs> um, but I'll try to overcome my nerves and, uh, and uh, you know, make sure I get through the, the highlights here, at least, and look forward to some questions with the other. So as Denise mentioned, my uh, research agenda is really sort of divided into several parts. So there's a real need, I think, to understand, to go out and observe reality and understand how institutions and management practices are affecting processes of energy policy and technology innovation. And I do this largely in emerging market energy systems, where in some ways, um, you know, it's the same story as what happened in the course of development in other places. In other respects, there are different pressures that drive innovation and, and uh, both on the technology and policy side in different directions. So we take that information that we get from, from the field, if you like, and we come back and simulate policies um, specifically, we, we're interested in how policy and technology interact in models that capture the sort of macro system. So but today I'm going to talk about how we've looked at the grid integration of, of wind energy, uh, but we've also done work on air quality, co-benefits of climate policy, and, and looked also at emissions trading um, and carbon pricing schemes in China. And I must emphasize that this is a multidisciplinary collaboration that would not be possible um, without the efforts and the um, um, close connections with our partners at Tsinghua University in China, as well as uh, with uh, folks across a range of disciplines. Um, so we have that, that, that set up at MIT and work across departments. Uh, some of uh, the air quality co-benefits work is together with folks in atmospheric sciences. And um, I think interdisciplinary research is something already, since I've been at Princeton this morning, it sounds like it's deeply rooted into your DNA as well, just for a bit. Um, and finally, we take what we learn from the projects and share our insights with stakeholders on the ground in policy communities through our um, MIT Tsinghua partnership, which is um, moving ahead. We will continue to collaborate um, with, uh, with China on many of these um, important energy issues. So uh, hopefully through this work, we strengthen and develop a shared understanding between um, colleagues at MIT and at Tsinghua, and then hopefully um, more broadly throughout the government and industry um, uh, connections on either side to understand sort of better what the room to maneuver, the potential for policy, the trajectories for technology, and how all of this comes together, hopefully in the long term, to mitigate uh, global climate change. So uh, this is our, our research team. Um, today I'm going to talk to you, uh, sorry, much of the work I'm about to show you is done by members of this team. Um, one of the important parts of our toolbox is our power systems modeling um, 
uh, capabilities, which we'll showcase in today. Um, but we also work on, as I said, um, we use a uh, wide range of models as well as empirical social science techniques uh, to really understand both from the macro and from the micro dimensions how these uh, important but challenging problems of transitioning energy systems in cleaner directions uh, can, be, can be resolved. So this work that I'm about to talk about is really essentially doing something very simple. So the idea here is we want to provide an estimate of potential wind energy generation in China that considers integration challenges. So how did, by integration, what I mean is the operational rules of the power system um, treat wind in particular ways vis-a-vis -vis existing generation and transmission constraints. And so we're going to look at this operational layer um, and come up with a better estimate of, at least we feel, what's a better estimate of future wind energy potential, grid integrated, we'll call it grid integrated economic wind potential in China. Now, so the key messages here are, first of all, the number. So I wouldn't, um, this number is subject to a whole range of sensitivities, but we, um, through this analysis, we estimate grid integrated economic wind generation um, in 2030 to be 2.6 petawatt hours per year. That's about 26% uh, of the projected electricity demand at that time, so that's significant. Um, but this number, 26 petawatt hours, is only about 10% of the total physical potential that we estimate and that other groups have estimated. So uh, I'll tell you why that is, why there's less wind available than perhaps um, other, other studies have suggested. Um, another important result that we find is with, once you include the integration costs, you would actually build more wind close to load centers rather than in distant wind-rich locations. And we find that in terms of the uncertainties, we do an extensive uncertainty analysis, we find that with more flexibility in the operation of the coal fleet, wind could deliver nearly 75% of China's 2030 non-fossil energy target, 20%. This is on a primary energy basis. It's not just electricity. So that's that's substantial. Okay, so just backing up, I think this needs no, uh, this topic needs no motivation in a room like this, but just to briefly say, China is, um, has blown past most other, uh, uh, all other nations, and even regional blocks like the EU to become the world's largest emitter of um, uh, energy-related CO2. There's also a lot of uncertainty in those um, numbers, but I think this figure makes clear that, that China is, uh, is uh, by far the largest emitter and is, uh, you know, the little, the little uncertainty that exists uh, dwarfs the, the, the challenge at hand in reducing CO2 emissions. So China has also recognized this, and I think takes very seriously the idea that it should transition its energy system away from um, a very coal heavy uh, uh, energy mix. And so China in Paris in December at the um, uh, UN climate talks, part of its uh, pledge, all countries made pledges, about 200 countries signed up to pledges. In fact, this Friday, we'll find out how many countries will actually sign the, the Paris climate agreement. China is, is very much at, at the front of all of this, um, making a pledge to reach its peak CO2 emissions um, by 2030, if not earlier, increase the non-fossil fuel share of its energy use to around 20% in 2030, reduce the CO2 intensity, um, and again, this is in service of reaching the peak and, um, uh, and also through the mechanism of increasing non-fossil fuel, reducing CO2 intensity of the economy by 60 to 65 percent by 2030, relative to 2005, and then finally it's made significant commitments to increase forest stock. So this agreement really built on, you know, um, uh, China's first global climate pledge in Copenhagen. The fact that indeed emissions continue to increase, um, making it actually in China's interest to think hard about this question of how to how to reduce coal use, not just for global climate reasons, but also for local air pollution reasons. And then um, in November of 2014, this deal was essentially agreed to by Xi and Obama, announced jointly um, at the APEC summit in Beijing. And so here we are today with this, this um, pledge now set to be signed by China this Friday on birthday. 
So climate change is one major motivation for cleaning up the energy system. I think if anyone's been to Beijing lately, you could sort of take your draw of which day you're going to land, whether it's going to look, this is 365 days of air, air quality in Beijing. Um, you can see many of these days are, are, are dark and gray. So uh, just to underscore, this is a major problem. Um, 1.6 million deaths are attributed to air pollution in China. Um, this was in 2013. Uh, this is maybe actually uh, too low. But air pollution is indeed one of the leading risk factors for disease and death in China. So there's a lot of interest in addressing coal use for this reason. So China has started, um, in order to uh, address both of these challenges, as, as well as build a domestic clean energy industry, China has seen massive growth in installed capacity in wind. And uh, I think this, this chart really says it best. You can see China is also head and shoulders above other countries in terms of installed capacity. Um, it has, the EU isn't separately represented here, but if it were a single block, China would have just exceeded that in terms of installed capacity, reaching 145 gigawatts in 2015. Um, and importantly, uh, you should note that uh, in 2015, only about 130 gigawatts of that capacity was actually connected to the grid. So China, you may have heard there's a gap between installations that are actually in place and the um, uh, those that are connected to the, the nation's growing electricity grid. Um, it used to be about a third of wind farms were not connected. You can see that gap is closing, but still, still quite significant. So, although this capacity growth is impressive, wind energy really makes only a modest contribution to total electricity generated. You can see that wind is that little tiny blue sliver at the top, and coal is the big red uh, elephant at the bottom. Now, China's uh, energy system, um, I mean, it sort of comes as no surprise that uh, it's using a lot of coal. It's also increasing its use of coal from all energy sources at a very rapid rate. So in the last decade, uh, electricity demand has grown about 152%. Now, what explains the mismatch between this huge capacity and this small generation? It's not just scales on an axis. In fact, it, what's happening is actually a lot of the wind that's generated in China, even if it gets to the grid, it's actually never used. And the reason, uh, and so instead we call that, it's, it's spilled or curtailed. Um, and the graph on the right hand side shows uh, how curtailment rates in different provinces in China have, have evolved over uh, recent years. So the um, black dots that you're seeing there, those are 2015, first uh, half of the year, curtailment rates, and you can see those are already quite a bit higher than in previous years, approaching 40%. So imagine 40% of the, of the um, wind-generated electricity that reaches the grid is actually not, not being utilized. So um, this is an empirical fact that we set out to, to think about um, in a modeling context. Um, and the stakes are high because China is expected to increase its wind installations um, by three times through 2030. We think it's high now, the parabolic line. Um, it's projected to continue to go up substantially. Um, in, in higher uh, projections, the red line um, up here uh, suggests that, in fact, you, know, you could see um, Installations that exceed, that meet or that reach or exceed, um, you know, upwards of, of 2,000 gigawatts, which I think, you know, is, is uh, the question is, is integrating that going to be substantially more difficult than integrating what China's facing today in 2015 with already a large share of spilled wind? So, our analysis really kind of builds up a method for getting from physical potential to grid integrated economic potential. And we start with physical potential, which is basically starting with, um, we, we start with a uh, description of, of, we use mirror read analysis data. So basically what we're doing is we have information about, that allows us to get to things like wind speed, um, well, 
uh, we apply a physical exclusion map, we figure out how much naturally available wind is there once all these considerations have been taken into account. Then we make a calculation for economic potential. And this says, how much wind would you build if you consider what the prevailing tariffs are and um, what the cost of building turbines in China today um, and what they're likely to be tomorrow. So we build in um, some uh, modest learning curve effect. We think about what it takes to actually, what's the cost of actually building a wind farm and whether that wind farm can be profitable. Now, we then go to look at the system level where we consider how much of that wind, once those farms have been built, uh, can be profitably utilized on the grid and how much of that is actually curtailed. And I'll explain how curtailment is calculated in just a moment. But the, I think the, the real innovation of this study, and the reason it's a pyramid, is because physical potential is huge. Economic potential, you narrow things down a bit more. You get to grid-connected economic potential. You're looking at just what you can really use, right? So um, uh, this is net of curtailment, and this is the sort of the uh, approach behind what, uh, what we've done in this research. So I'll tell you quickly about physical and economic potential. I've already given a few hints, but this is actually the map. If you, um, if you take the underlying wind resource data, which um, is taken from the modern, modern era retrospective analysis for research and applications, or MERA uh, data set, which um, is assembled using reanalysis techniques. It has hourly data points for, um, for uh, uh, a number of years, um, we've looked at sensitivity to uh, interannual variability in, in doing this and put together a map that really shows what the capacity factor, so this is how much wind is available in each grid cell would be um, once you've accounted for these physical exclusions. So uh, you can see that most of the uh, uh, best wind resources up here in Inner Mongolia and in the Northeast, um, as well as uh, to some extent out here in Xinjiang where they're already um, wind basis plan. Um, and then there's, there's uh, modest potential uh, sort of here in the uh, central part of the country. And all of this information is being uh, used to calculate a number for the physical potential. What we also then do, so on the right hand side, I'm describing how we take the capacity factor and we combine that with just in a standard economic levelized cost model, we take the capital cost of wind turbines take the operation and maintenance cost um, using latest available estimates from China. Tax rates are also important, it turns out. Um, and then we have, uh, we look at that um, in, in, uh, in terms of generating, you can imagine this map as instead of a capacity factor map, could be a levelized cost of wind generated uh, map for China. So this is, you get a cost of generation for each grid cell. Now this says, great, so you stop here, you get economic potential. It tells you you have a lot of wind available. You haven't yet considered the challenge of bringing that wind into the electricity system. So in order to consider the rest of the system, we actually need information on what's planned for 2030 and China's different grid regions. So first of all, I should say China's divided into four, in, in this study, four major grid regions. There are actually six in total, three of which are aggregated in the Sanhua um, uh, region in the middle. Um, that is by far the largest load. Um, the northwest, the northeast, and the south, uh, which has a standalone, standalone grid, um, are, are all uh, significantly smaller. And Sanhua is also very cold heavy. So we think about. Um, uh, we, in this analysis, we're starting with these projections, which come from the state grid company, of how much electricity of different types, with, with the largest, probably not surprisingly, the black bar is being coal, and then you have hydro, nuclear, and some additional gas in line with national plans or something the online. Of the units in this figure? These are gigawatts. So, um, so then we take uh, we we go to our economic dispatch model, and what we're doing here is in between. Um, if any of you are familiar with sort of screening curve approach, we're somewhere in between the level of detail in a simplified model and uh, well, still very simplified model 
uh, here, but we, we add more detail, but we don't get all the way to a full unit commitment model. So we're somewhere in between. What we're doing is we're taking, we're constructing a load uh, forecast for China. So this black line is, is, uh, is load, um, and we represent each of those generation types I showed in the last slide in terms of generation layers. So you start with your must run uh, layer, which includes nuclear, coal, and actually some modest biomass um, generation. We then have hydropower. Um, beyond that, there's additional dispatchable coal, which we can separate out using information on the composition of plants in China's power sector. And uh, then we have natural gas being used as peaking capacity. We do this by region. Okay, so we're following what the map that I showed previously. And what we're doing is um, we're allowing, so we're running the model out for um, uh, all the hours over a year. Um, we're giving preference to uh, the, the <coughs> flexible generation types. Um, we're capturing characteristics such as ramping and how that impacts costs. And uh, we also in that must run layer include a, a large contribution in some regions from combined heat and power or um, what is uh, uh, very prevalent in the Northeast as a source of, of heating, which essentially produces free electricity. So it's very inflexible once it comes on in the winter to meet district heating loads. So what we're doing here is we're actually saying that any time that uh, net load goes below this must-run threshold because you have wind coming online. We're actually curtailing the wind to allow for the base load uh, generation to run. And so that's how we're, we're calculating curtailment across the year. And then we're using a routine that incorporates that curtailment cost. So uh, this is a, a, compli a somewhat complicated slide, but the idea here is that for each region, we have pairs of generation uh, a wind generation from a region, and it's integrated either in the same region or in a neighboring region. Um, so in this case, we have six uh, sort of generation integration pairs. This is northeast integrated in northeast, northeast integrated in San Juan, that central part. Um, wind generated in the northwest, integrated in the northwest, northwest grid, uh, wind integrated in San Juan. And then uh, Sanhua integrated in Sanhua and Self integrated in Self. The Self is a separate grid, and there's not really any material interconnection between the South and the rest of the country. So what we're doing is we're basically taking an approach where we order costs of cells, we capture both the generation costs as well as the integration and curtailment costs, which we add in as this orange portion, and then we have a, um, a uh, ramping cost. Uh, and reserve costs captured here in the top black bar. So what we're doing is we're essentially looking, scanning across all six of these potential generation integration pairs. Um, this is a uh, you know, region where the wind is generated, region where the wind is used together, uh, considering what is the cost of getting wind from that location after accounting for the fact that you have um, that you have curtailment occurring. And what we do is we construct a supply curve for wind. So this is um, sort of standard uh, cost curve, uh, which is where each of these bars, the width of these bars, corresponds to the resource available at that cost, and um, the height of the bar is the is the cost of so levelized cost inclusive of integration cost um, of using that wind resource. And so, um, as we update the supply curve, we then go back, update the regional residual demand, the transmission capacity available. Um, we reset the cell pointer and then we repeat this step um, uh, and go back through the cycle until we've constructed the whole supply curve. And what we find, um, or what we get, is a supply curve for grid integrated wind in China. So this is, um, this actually, uh, it takes about a day to produce on a personal desktop machine. Um, it's not, it's not horrible, but that's mainly because we've simplified the unit commitment problem significantly by using this heuristic dispatch model. And what we have here then is uh, a way of saying, okay, we have uh, electricity, uh, you know, a, a prevailing um, uh, price inclusive of the feed-in tariff here. Um, let's assume that threshold is 0.6 yuan per kilowatt hour. That tells us that, okay, we actually get 2.6 kilowatt hours 
uh, win available, um, inclusive, again, of, of uh, integration penalty, that you can see these integration penalties really increase as you go um, to more and more marginal wind resources. And what you find is that actually a lot of what you're bringing online here in the low cost range is northeast generators, um, which where the resource is good, but you quickly actually go to bring in uh, more, uh, say, sources of wind that are more proximate to load centers. For example, this is the San Juan Central region. You can see there's a lot of blue here. Whereas if you just ordered this per based on um, based on cost without considering curtailment, you would have brought in a lot of this green here in the northeast, um, as well as more uh, northwestern generation. So, how do we compare it to other studies? Well, um, the names have been masked to protect the innocent over here, but. I think the, the point here is that our study is this, um, uh, all the yellow dots uh, and triangles. Um, we, this is our uh, for economic potential without considering integration. And when you consider integration, the, it drops dramatically. So this is actually in line with some studies, um, but also much lower than many of the other studies, particularly those that are focusing just on physical potential. So this shows how important it is to uh, to consider integration costs, or at least to be really clear about what you're considering and what you're not considering when you're making these calculations. Wait, so you're showing basically that you're putting it lower than other studies, and that potential is quite low? Well, the potential, well, so relative to other studies, potential is really low. Relative to our own estimate of, um, of uh, physical potential, we're about to 10% of that physical potential, uh, once you consider the economic uh, grid integrated economic potential. So you go narrow down what's available based on that. Now, if you put to put that in perspective, though, um, that number corresponds to about let's say it's 930 gigawatts of installed wind in China in 2030, which is about more than double what they're targeting now. So they're saying that lower bound projection, 400 gigawatts. It's not as high as their higher projection of, of 1,000 gigawatts, but it's right in the in the in the range. So we're actually saying that for 2030, you know, if, if they get the operational rules right, you could actually have wind make a much larger contribution than the lower amount estimate would expect. It's the, I think the, the um, McElroy paper uh, that was the, one of the, I think the very first to quantify physical and economic potential saw wind uh, resource in great excess of what the grid could actually absorb. It was equivalent to China's energy use, you know, um, uh, or there was enough wind available to supply China's energy use. Um, so does this, just, sorry, yeah. one last question. Does this imply then that if the country is willing to pay more, you could have higher penetration, or that the grid just can't tolerate this higher penetration? So, <laughs> what the, so um, what it's saying here is that. Uh, with, given the current gener um, transmission expansion plans and current, given the current feed-in tariff levels, uh, this is how much economic potential is available, and that's all, and that's how much the grid could tolerate, and that's about it's more than twice what China has said it plans to build. Um, and it's, it's generation equivalent to about twice what China says it plans to build. So I think it is still good news. You can still see. Um, I mean, if, if you care about reducing carbon emissions, I think what I'll show in the next step, what I'll show you is the impact that the flexibility of the coal fleet makes on on um, on grid integrated wind. Of course, I think you know um, we're not saying that China could survive solely on wind. I mean, given its current um, energy system <laughs> configuration and the time frame involved. What, what fraction is wind when we have this? The situation here. What fraction of electricity gigawatt hours is wind? Uh, it's twenty six percent. So it's twenty six percent, and at that point, you're paying quite a bit of electricity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So we then go on to consider a number of sensitivities, which is really important. I think more important even than the number that we provided, two point six petawatt hours. So um, we first consider physical. Uh, 
sensitivities. So we look at turbine spacing, we look at uh, for offshore we look at water depth. Uh, for economic sensitivities, we consider the willingness to pay for electricity essentially includes both of the um, cost that the government is willing to uh, set, so the price that consumers pay, um, as well as any feed-in tariff policy, which China currently has in place. We then also look at the impact of um, operations and maintenance costs, uh, and so we find, you know, we find modest effects. We get into the grid uh, sensitivities. We look at ramping and reserve costs, into, um, integration costs, uh, which is basically the curtailment costs here. And then we look at uh, ultra high voltage transmission sensitivities as well. And so we put all of that together on, on one graph where we have the base case. And you can see that when you use, when you adopt uh, high and low thresholds for each of these, and those thresholds are informed based on uh, essentially a combination of expert elicitation as well as published documents on what uh, technical potentials um, might be. Uh, we find that that you have um, by far of all of these different sensitivities, the flexibility of the operation of the coal fleet, and this includes um, ramping, this includes the ability, uh, it includes the scheduling of, um, for example, the power plants, that, that coal flexibility uh, <coughs> dimension is, is uh, tremendously important. So if we look at coal flexibility and we think that we can we have a chance of changing some of these operational rules in the power system if you the high end of that uh, wind potential estimate is equivalent to 75 percent of China's non-fossil energy target so that's really significant I mean even after you consider um, uh, all of these uh, integration penalties wind could deliver quite a lot uh, in uh, in China's energy system in 2030 and this I'm going to argue that this getting to that high potential requires um, political will as much as it requires better technology and planning. So I just want to say a few words about how we think about um, coal generator inflexibility. So why would you want to, uh, you know, consider this? Well, China, especially in that Sanhua region, is, is very coal heavy uh, in terms of its uh, power system. Many of those plants uh, in the Northeast are, are combined heat and power plants. So, um, what can you do to use that fleet more flexibly? Well, you can adjust cycling times, um, for example, for hot starts, you know, not shutting the plant down completely, setting a commitment schedules more frequently, and also um, removing uh, minimum generation set points or adjusting those um, in line with, with technical considerations. So there's, there are, um, there's some leverage there. There's also, um, you could imagine, there are ways of handling <coughs> Um, the combined heat and power plant inflexibility as well, for example, going to uh, heat storage for those facilities or using electric boilers that would um, provide heat using an alternative uh, pathway to those, those very cold regions, um, as is often frequently done in Denmark, for example. And so, um, again, I think that one of the major results here is that if you alter these scheduling practices, and increase the coal unit flexibility, you can actually get an increase in the wind potential of 20%. So um, this just shows that we have these, this is unpacking these three scenarios a little bit more. Uh, one of the features of China's electric power system, so let me step back and say China's electric power system um, has uh, evolved along with the rest of the country's economy since the reform and opening period began in late 1970s, early 1980s. But compared to, say, high-tech sectors or even manufacturing, the, the operational rules and the institutions used in the power system still <coughs> largely reflect a planning mentality, much more than you might see in you know, some of the more fast-moving, um, you know, uh, say, sort of IT-oriented sectors. You know, there's a huge, huge difference. And so thinking sector by sector about how these, uh, how governance occurs, how projections are updated is really actually pretty important. So in the electricity sector, for example, China um, has a, uh, something what they call a minimum mode, which is basically a uh, coal plant is guaranteed to run for 40% of its operating hours. It's basically, basically told beginning of the year, your plan 
involves operations for 40% um, of the um, 8,760 hours in a year. And so uh, we are going to dial that in for you, basically. So the, the planning horizon is largely one year, and to some extent, there are adjustments made at the level of one month, and then sometimes at the level of one week. But again, um, there's there's not you know there's nothing akin to merit order dispatch, real time adjustments, a next day um, or day ahead at bidding is um, only is, is, is the exception more than the rule. So um, if we look at so we have these minimum modes that we dialed in. If you reduce that minimum mode, you get more flexibility. That's pretty clear, I think. You have um, a combined heat and power output. You can argue that in, in China, in many cases, this is a fixed output across a year. You basically, you're a, you also have a minimum mode, but that minimum mode in the winter time might be 90%. So that means that those plants always co-generate electricity at the same time that providing heat. But then you can imagine taking that um, uh, through, whether it be heat storage or other means, going to a flexible regime. And then finally, we look at scheduling. So um, the scheduling right now is done based on weekly peak load. Um, if you move to an eight-hour peak load scheduling, you get a lot more flexibility in the system. So you're basically um, keeping reserves online to meet uh, the eight-hour maximum rather than the weekly expected maximum and you're making that decision on a shorter time frame. And so this is the, um, uh, the bottom, what you're seeing is then the wind potential that emerges under each of these three <coughs> scenarios, from the most flexible to the most rigid. So yes. before, just before you move, so uh, the difference between cold flex and reference, there's two, there's the P-min, uh, well, the, the, elect the minimum electric from the coal and the scheduling. Uh, so do, do you know which of these two kind of explains most of the difference the width potential, or are they roughly equal? Yeah, I can show you the full results for that. So, um, so um, yeah, so you're looking at uh, fixed versus flexible. Let's see, um, so I think that I mean, my recollection is that you get a pretty big. The, the minimum mode is pretty decisive. This is this p-min. Um, <laughs> but then you get, I know you get big benefits from going to the weekly schedule. So what we've, what we've shown in the in these uh, three scenarios are essentially the extremes. But yeah, so you can, so this gives you a sense of how how each of those contributes. So if you look um, uh, fixed versus flexible, uh, yeah, I mean you could you could calculate the changes for each of those if you wanted to. But it, we did the full factorial, and um, we just report the min and max as the extremes with the least flexible and most flexible cases. So let's see. So okay. So so hopefully um, by this point I've made a case that coal flexibility is really important, and and um, one of the reasons why it's important for China to think about these integration <coughs> costs and the flexibility in the system now is because they're they're planning ahead to build uh, significant wind capacity and they're locating it largely in distant wind rich parts of the country like Xinjiang and uh, northern Gansu and parts of Inner Mongolia all the way up into the northeast. Um, there are some located closer to load centers uh, but these actually um, uh, I think you could, the, the, these are sort of more the exception than the rule. This is largely, um, I think, due to policies in Shanghai that they would like to have approximate wind. Um, so we can think about, well, if we look at our study, um, our study would suggest that you'd actually want to get only about 14% of your wind energy from the northeast, about 21% from the northwest. In state grids plans, they have uh, target, targeted 25% uh, each from the northeast and the northwest. So relative to those plans, our results suggest that, um, in fact, wind should be built uh, closer to load centers relative uh, to these, these far flung locations, even though the wind resource quality is better. So can you recap why that is? Because the transmission costs are pretty small, looks from your earlier slide. It's really the curtailment cost. So this is basically- to avoid curtailment then. Yeah. 
that with your conclusions would change. Exactly, because curtailment has a cost to it, which we've monetized in terms of what the wind farm must absorb um, from not being able to sell its electricity. So is that political obstacle to be overcome then? Yes. Your conclusion would be different. If, well, let's say if you, so that would, that goes to the, um, to this set of assumptions. So right now, China is very much in this world where you have um, minimum output thresholds, you have a lot of rigid generation. There's some of this is technical and some of this is administrative. And so I think that administrative reforms, you know, you could think about ways of, of uh, and now they're experimenting with more bilateral contracts, which are hopefully um, going to going to help um, uh, ensure uh, that wind reaches customers at some level. It's also going to um, it's going to change the pricing strategy, the, the pricing scheme overall. They haven't moved yet to a merit order dispatch system, um, and that's, I mean, the electricity reform uh, process has been a, has been long and slow. Um, 2002, they broke up generation to uh, to induce more competition upstream, but the grid company still remains um, a essentially, I mean. A, Justified as a natural monopoly, but it's essentially a, a um, in, in many ways it dictates uh, decisions like the decision to site wind in distant places so that they can actually build out transmission lines at a high cost, but they're the ones who provide the transmission, right? So it's actually that the, so, so there's a conflict between doing that and actually building wind closer to load centers where um, the provincial governments would prefer the local generation because they derive tax benefits directly from having um, wind generation and other types of generation, obviously coal, because that's what they're preferring. This is this is an elaborate way of saying we prefer coal, and every province in, con in connection with the um, central government determines what their minimum output thresholds for coal generators will be. And this persists despite the fact that China makes a big, um, well, in the announcement in, in September on climate change, there was a big um, focus on, on what's called green dispatch. And I think green dispatch actually hasn't materialized in the way that uh, many people thought it would because basically, yeah, you might say, well, you have to flip 100 hours here or there, coal for something cleaner like gas or wind, but it's not making uh, a dent in sort of the big picture. Um, and so this is something we, we continue to, to think about how to model better and, and how to provide some useful advice those who are making the decisions. Yes? So I guess you're late to this question. I'm wondering, um, it sounds like there's sort of an administrative political holdup to building this this flexibility. Is there anything like the FERC in China that's like looking at the whole system? This is a great question. So there was something like FERC. Um, it, was, uh, it was called the State Electricity Regulatory Commission. It was created in the early 2000s when the reforms were starting to gain momentum. And that um, regulatory body was essentially toothless because it was at the mercy of state grid and others and, and powerful uh, political actors that um, didn't allow it to do its job, basically. And it's going to be completely frank. Um, so what happened is, I guess, in 2011 or 12, it was absorbed into the National Energy Administration in China. And those regulatory functions are now presumably vested with the NEA, which could we argue is a good thing because NEA has more power, um, but you don't really have an independent regulator because NEA also makes the plans for wind deployment, um, whereas coal is largely a, a local, well, it's, it's already an installed base. It's very much there are local actors that are um, invested in in using and generating from coal. Yes? You didn't mention much, much about offshore wind, except that they look at one there's some water there. But some of these load centers, like Shanghai and Beijing, they are at the coast. Yeah. So, so wouldn't it be a good idea to, to I mean, they are expensive to put up the foundations, but the grid cost might be, uh, might be lower. Yes, and that's exactly right. And Shanghai has, has succeeded, and I think that one power base that was shown here, um, uh, this, this was um, at least in part intended to be offshore. Um, Shanghai is politically very powerful. It can uh, decide that it wants to generate its electricity locally and make decisions um, about which electricity 
types it will build. The other parts of the country, especially, I guess, you don't see any other large plans. The other issue with the coastal generation is that it's actually very expensive. It's beneficial here in Shanghai because there are um, companies and, and um, policymakers that are interested in, in keeping uh, the uh, feed in tariff revenues, which are recycled to the center, but then come back to uh, a redistributed portion to the load in different parts of the country. Is that kind of, so Shanghai actually sees significant benefits from participating in the federal central feed in tariff program. And so there are a number of reasons why this makes sense in Shanghai in particular, but in terms of our analysis, we don't find a huge amount of offshore potential because the costs are still too high relative to other electricity sources in the Chinese context. So Shanghai would be taking a bit of an economic hit, but they might have other reasons. What is it like the water depth around China? I, I may be wrong, but I thought it was relatively low. Uh, you, it's, it's relatively low. Um, I mean, it yeah, it depends on how far offshore you want to build. Um, it eventually you can get to depths that I think you, you're seeing in terms of offshore. You're not seeing the turbines at the height that you see in the North Sea and then the the sort of uh, girth that you require. There's also talk about floating turbines. So there's you know there are different configurations in question. But yeah, we consider water depth in terms of technology choices. So uh, I'm just going to very briefly, I think I've talked about this at some level, but these are some of the, since this is um, the Woodrow Wilson School, I just wanted to go through a few of the institutional challenges here, maybe a little bit more detail, very, very quickly uh, before concluding. So um, there are a couple principles that are applied in dispatch in China that we have partially considered in the way we design these scenarios. But I'd like to argue that if we did consider these fully, you would actually get even lower uh, Wind, a grid connected wind energy potential in China. So one is this equitable dispatch idea, it's called San Wong Diao So the idea is that uh, within a province, the, within a balancing area, you actually, um, plants are entitled to equal shares of the costs and benefits for generation, at, again, at the provincial level, this is like the state level in China. Um, so there are quotas, there are also um, principles like equal curtailment allocation within provinces that, that that are designed largely for equity, but not for efficiency considerations. The other is what I mentioned with this minimum mode or um, uh, the minimum uh, viable operation. This is basically, it's um, uh, basically just a sum of committed plant, uh, submitted minimum outputs. So um, for a particular area, there is some minimum mode that you can actually model. I think this is the most amenable to actually modeling. And then um, the idea, of course, is that there is energy efficient dispatch, but um, what it, it's, uh, this is all done after the minimum mode, so you're basically um, presumably doing prioritizing renewable energy, going then high efficiency coal, then low efficiency coal, but in practice, that's limited by um, the minimum mode calculation. And so um, the other issue is, of course, that every province, you know, even within provinces, there are different grid regions, everybody does dispatch a little differently. We haven't modeled all the idiosyncrasies, but we think that we've got most of the story. So again, uh, back to the main messages. So um, we estimate potential grid integrated economic wind generation in 2030 at 26 um, petawatt hours per year. Again, that's 26% of total electricity demand forecast uh, for 2030. Um, we see a strong argument for building more wind capacity near load centers in the near term rather than the distant wind rich locations. And with more coal flexibility, uh, wind could deliver significantly more. I mean, we find 75% of China's 2030 non fossil energy target, but even getting close to that would mean uh, would go a long way um, and might displace, if you could imagine. Um, would significantly change the plans for meeting uh, those goals with, on that time frame. So uh, just a few additional implications. So um, uh, at 20, uh, so at 2.6 petawatt hours, this is about 900, I think I mentioned this, 2030, uh, 930 gigawatts in 2030, uh, wind, uh, which is currently, um, which is much larger than the unofficial target of 400 gigawatts currently planned. Um, and uh, again, 
Um, this is, you can imagine, you could actually integrate more wind than this if coal is used more flexibly. So I think it's still an optimistic story for wind, right? It's, it's just about using it in you know, smart, um, flexible uh, ways. The, um, this study, I think, is important because most previous studies only consider physical and economic potential, and those are used to inform capacity targets. So that's why state grid tends to rely on those without considering this integration cost step. But decisions are actually different once you consider the integration cost step. And uh, we think, and we're communicating to folks in China that, that it makes sense to try to optimize the placement of wind so that you can maximize the contribution to generation and not just to capacity. So with that, um, I have to thank my co-authors, Michael Davidson, Da Zhang, Xiong uh, Wenying, and Zhang Xiliang, um, for their contributions. And I look forward to your questions in the last slide. I'm wondering, have you also considered the sensitivity on the demand side? Because I was wondering if we have, uh, if in the future we have more successful wind development, so we could imagine that the low curve in the wind abundant region can shift upward, and that would make the permanent wind less necessary than what is shown here. So yes, and obviously if you have more demand in those windward regions, um, it it does reduce curtailment. The thing you have to be careful about with that is if. Um, if that's demand that you're displacing from somewhere else, then you're contributing overall to uh, reduction in fossil, uh, fossil energy use, reduction in CO2 emissions. But if you're actually just creating demand to absorb wind, where it wouldn't have existed otherwise, which is actually the case in northern parts of Hebei province, for example, they're, they're planning electric vehicle cities to absorb all of the wind that's not being used on the grid. I think this is actually the wrong direction. It's, it, it's helping um, planners to avoid hard questions about how to change the operational rules of the system, and I would much prefer to see those operational rules uh, change. Yes? I think in, in many countries, the renewable energies like wind get priority um, sort of over everything. Here, it seems like it's a, it's a great aid in the sense that it gets priority over some things, but not over other things. Can you comment on, on the contrast between China and, say, Germany? Sure, yeah. So um, in Germany, I, for my understanding is that there's minimal curtailment allowed. And it's, it used to be that no curtailment was allowed. And now minimal curtailment is allowed based on economic considerations. For example, if the cost of wind goes negative, um, you, you might, and, and it does. It does in Texas also. So you can imagine that you could curtail that. You could choose not to generate rather than to pay to have your wind um, taken. Now, um, in, in, but in those systems, because I think you have the flexibility to set um, your generation mix on a much shorter time frame, so uh, day ahead, um, uh, you can actually, through trading mechanisms, um, end up with a much more cost-effective, real-time uh, uh, dispatch outcome that reflects also uh, the forecast, forecasts, which are much better on a day ahead basis than they are on a week ahead basis. Um, and so I think it's those factors that lead to significantly reduced curtailment. The other thing that affects curtailment in, in Western experience has been just if you build out more transmission, you can integrate more wind. So this was the case in Berkhoff, Texas. I think. Um, if you look at China, part of the challenge has been getting transmission out there, but many of those wind turbines are now connected. The challenge has really been the scheduling time horizon, which actually, in practice, doesn't allow you to make use of forecasts. And if you could, then you would, if, you, if you could use that information to make, and you have the authority to tell that coal generator, I'm sorry, I'm going to pay you instead of having you generate today, that, that, that system doesn't exist, and I think that's the main reason why you see a lot more curtailment in China relative to systems like Germany, which still have a lot of coal. But and, and how do they compare on feed-in tariffs? Um, so China <coughs> has a universal feed-in tariff uh, for, uh, well, I should say it's graded by wind resource, but it doesn't matter where it's being, you know, 
who's using it, where it's being used. A lot of it is applied to um, wind farm installations. And I think on, in terms of levels, the, the um, tariff inclusive of the feed-in tariff is lower in China than it is in Germany um, by, by, a long, by a large margin. Um, but in terms of how it's applied, in Germany, it's largely your, uh, basically, the grid company is required to take off, take my solar generation, my wind generation. Um, and a lot of it, I mean, not, certainly not all of it, but a lot of it is rooftop uh, installations. Because in China, very few rooftop installations. State grid is, is, is a very strong player in the renewable energy space in China. So what it means is that essentially you're, um, you're getting uh, the, the feed-in tariffs are actually benefiting and inducing lots of capacity expansion without much attention to utilization. Yes? Uh, so, I was interested and in, in, in a little curious how you were focusing on the use of coal as a way of balancing the variability of wind. In, in my models, uh, so PGM, when they do, when we plan in the U.S. coal, that's planned in 12 to 36 hours out. And yeah. because you're boiling water, really pretty much a minimum of eight hours. But here in the U.S., the, the, the standard planning process is to, to sit at noon and plan midnight to midnight tomorrow, so 12 to 36 hours. Mm -hmm. Forecast 12 to 36 hours are easily 100% errors. So this is from that's a German, yeah, German software vendor. Forecasts that far out are really terrible. Yeah. So the way we handle wind is gas, especially gas turbines that are planned an hour out. And I didn't hear that mentioned here, but that's the magic wand that my models are using to handle wind. So I think that, um, and you're right to point out that gas is uh, far more flexible than coal. I, I don't disagree. I think what we, um, we did a sensitivity case where we significantly increased the contribution of gas in the system. And we found that you got an, an increase of less than 10% in terms of the wind potential. So it, was, it had an impact. Okay, and, I, and I'd have to go back and tell you exactly how much additional gas we put in the system, but the issue is that on the 2015 to 2030 time frame, it's going to be very difficult to shift the nation away from coal. But just as a final follow-up on our morning conversation, my understanding is that you're not actually modeling the details of the uncertainty of the dispatch. So possibly you're underestimating the issue of uncertainty when you model coal? We could be. So I think we are... Um, uh, <coughs> Overestimating the inflexibility of coal, and because of the generation layers approach, you're absolutely right. We are, I think, we are overlooking some sources of, of flexibility. And, you know, we're, we're going to underestimate it for the contribution of gas. Um, but we think that uh, that this that, that that's not. I mean, based on our sensitivity analysis, that doesn't seem to matter as much um, as basically the fact that gas is not economic in China. It's the cost of gas in Asia is easily three or four times higher than, than North America. And um, even if that were to change, there's a lot of alternative uses of gas that would are now prioritized, like industrial uses are prioritized to take up that gas. So, so you know, I, I, I hear you. I think it's important. We, we need to pay more attention to power. But it reminds me that all energy is local. Yes. It's time for one more. Especially electricity. So what fraction of the non-carbon or non-fossil electricity in 2030 is planned for? Like you said 75% is what you get. And what fraction of it we have? So what I'm hearing, although you can say it, maybe you're wrong, is that there's, a, there's going to be a, a shootout between the OK Corral, between wind and nuclear, by your way. Wind has already surpassed nuclear, even though I mean, the capacities are obviously very different, but on the generation side, wind has surpassed nuclear. The plan for 2030, when nuclear is gaining, is it, going to be yeah. available, I think. Well, there's, so there's some uncertainty in the demand projection, especially with the recent economic headwinds. So depending on your, I think the short answer to your question is yes, absolutely. If wind and nuclear, and possibly also solar, which is slated to come online with 400 gigawatts, which I think is, is in my view, is very optimistic given um, uh, current expectations as well as what we know now about the interaction. We're learning things about the interaction between solar and wind as well in this type of system that is going to penalize it. So, so I think the shootout would be mainly between wind and nuclear, but, but, but solar will be a, 
in the background.